Hello, everyone. Welcome to Thunder Goats Live Investment Summit. I'm pleased to introduce the president and CEO, Wes Hansen. Wes will review the latest Thunder Gold corporate deck. Afterwards, we'll do a Q&A session. So feel free to submit any questions on the right-hand side of your screen there in the bottom corner. If you'd like to get in touch with the Thunder Gold team, I will be submitting a survey in the Q&A chat once we start the Q&A session. As always, this is going to be recorded and will be available on 6.com in the coming days. So without further ado, I'll let you kick things off here, Wes. Hey, thanks, Kyle. And, and thanks to Six for hosting this event online. And thanks for everyone taking time out of their day to attend, uh, attend this presentation. Thunder Gold is a company based out of Thunder Bay, Ontario, hence the, uh, the background photo in this uh, opening slide. We believe we hold the right project. Uh, we've acquired it at the right time and that we have the right team to drive shareholder value going forward. I'm a QP with over 40 years of experience. I'm a professional geologist. I've, there's act, virtually, I, I defy anybody to name a job that I haven't done uh, in the mining or mineral exploration space. Uh, this forward looking statement basically tells you I'm about to tell you uh, nothing but the truth, the whole truth. So help me God. So let's get into the meat of the matter. Um, I was, uh, as I said, a 40 year uh, a geologist, professional geologist with over 40 years of experience in the industry. I was kind of looking to, to transition out of the uh, out of the space and start enjoying life and, and uh, you know, semi retired. I, I was going to keep my finger in a few pies, but I wasn't really looking for a full time uh, opportunity by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, uh, I was approached by the then what was then known as White Metal Resources to fill their vacant CEO role uh, about a year ago, and I declined several times because I, I understand what the role of the CEO entails, and and I wasn't really willing to commit to uh, to another junior company at that particular junction in time, and and uh, they kept bringing uh, they kept coming back to me and asking me if I'd reconsider and. You know, finally, they convinced me to take a look at the data, and, and uh, that was a smart move on their part because one thing about data is it rarely ever lies, and, and the other thing is the data from the uh, their primary asset, which is the Tower Mountain pro property located just outside of Thunder Bay, Ontario, was a very compelling opportunity. I recognized it right away, and, and what I see is an opportunity for a, a Tier 1 large tonnage low-grade discovery. Uh, this discovery has the opportunity for over 10 million ounces of total resources or perhaps more uh, capable of producing over 500,000 ounces of gold annually with a greater than a 10 year mine life. And that's the target that we're talking about here. Uh, there's no guarantees. There's a lot of exploration work that's going to have to be done to, to, to establish that target. But the important thing for you as an investor to remember is that the opportunity is absolutely there. And I'm going to demonstrate why as we go through the presentation. So the property is 50 kilometers from the port city of Thunder Bay. And that's important for a couple of factors. First of all, that proximity to established infrastructure is a huge benefit. I don't have to build um, airlines or airports or railroads or roads or anything. All of that inf infrastructure is already in place. Thunder Bay is a resource sector town with a population of over 100,000 people. It's uh, 50 kilometers away with access via a paved highway. There's no logging roads to take. There's no sketchy uh, trails that you have to uh, expand or, or uh, you know, rehabilitate in order to access the property. We can drive by highway and then we have a three kilometer road, uh, dirt road path that we have to take to get to the, uh, to get to the property's core shack. Uh, this is at the Eastern Shabandouin Greenstone Belt is uh, largely unexplored green. In, in the uh, cultural resources, about six million ounces in the in the gram, uh, one gram per ton range. But recently, uh, the company to the northwest of us, within ten kilometers, Delta Resources, has been issuing a series of very positive drill results that indicate potential for them to have a deposit similar to what we've begun to outline at Tower Mountain. So now you have two multi-million ounce uh, opportunities within the 10 kilometer radius of one another, which demonstrates district scale potential of this camp. And that's an, that's an extraordinarily important 
um, change in the situation for, for both us and Delta. Now you've got two projects in parallel that have huge upside opportunity. Tower Mountain is by far the more advanced project of the two. Uh, there's no, more than 24 known geochemical targets. About half of those have been drilled. Over 190 drill holes have been completed, totaling about 41,000 meters. And off that 41,000 meters, over 40,000 have been sampled. That's been sampled entirely for gold. And uh, approximately 20 to 25% of the database has been sampled for other elements. There are currently no significant element, elements other than gold that are of economic interest. There are some areas of elevated copper grade, but uh, really nothing of significance to date. Uh, of course, that could all change with continued exploration over time. What that drilling has defined is a zone of gold mineralization along the western boundary of the Tower Mountain Intrusive Complex that measures 1,800 meters along strike and remains open along strike. It has been, uh, it's approximately 300 meters wide on average, ranging from 100 meters at the narrowest point to 500 meters at the widest. And it's been drill tested to a depth of 500 meters and it remains open at depth. And 25% of the total drill holes completed on the project end in economically viable gold mineralization. So there's lots of opportunities at depth and along strike and I'll get into the details on that uh, shortly. Premium jurisdiction, I mean, province of Ontario, one of the most preferred mining jurisdictions in the world. The infrastructure is in place, as I alluded to. We not only have highway access, but both national railroads are within three kilometers of the northern boundary of the property. And there's an Ontario hydro line that crosses the claim block. Uh, this, we've established the metallurgy of this particular uh, exploration opportunity. Uh, results of our preliminary metallurgical test worker indicating uh, recoveries of greater than 90%. We have proven geophysical vectors that improve our uh, ability to target the system and, and return viable results. And we have, best of all, our geophysical vectors indicate a potential to increase our known strike length by three to five times over the currently defined 1800 meters. So there's lots of upside potential on this particular project. Drilling costs are quite low, less than $250 uh, a meter, which is spectacular in today's market. Our corporate burn rate is low, less than $50,000 a month. And the management and board of the company have extensive experience, particularly with large tonnage, low grade deposits. So we know what we're looking for. We know how to find it and we know how to drill it efficiently. Our objective is simple. We want to demonstrate that Tower Mountain has the opportunity or offers the potential for a tier one gold discovery. And we want to rapidly establish that opportunity um, define the quantity and quality of the mineral resources as quickly as we can and hopefully attract a takeover bid at some point in time in the future from a producing uh, from a gold producing issuer. So this is the uh, Eastern Chibandu and Greenstone Belt. I know that Delta Resources has been releasing positive results and they've just announced a major new drill program where they're going to be expanding on their Delta One discovery. It's approximately 10 kilometers to the northwest of Tower Mountain, which is our gold discovery, uh, Thunder Gold. Now that is that lies dead on the lithostructural trend of the district. These are all, uh, basically these are all uh, intermediate to mafic uh, volcanics and volcanoplastic rocks. And the uh, delta indicates that they're following uh, uh, potentially a structural type system. So more classic of the superior greenstone belts with shearing mineralization hosted in shearing and associated with quartz, uh, quartz carbonate tourmaline veins and, and uh, um, the plastic deformation that's associated with the shear zones. Ours is kind of a unique beast for superior greenstones. Uh, our deposit at Tower Mountain appears to be an intrusion related gold deposit. It is directly linked to the Tower Mountain intrusive complex, a three kilometer long by two kilometer wide oval um, sequence or, or series of uh, successive intrusive events ranging from cyanites to uh, to diorites and and but dominantly it's the alkalic cyanites and and monzonites that comprise that uh, central intrusive core and that appears to have introduced mineralization as a halo around that entire uh, intrusive core and that's what we're targeting with our exploration program as i noted delta is a game changer it's uh, it demonstrates the district potential of this particular camp I'm sure not, uh, I don't have to go through this with uh, with anybody on this call. This is uh, this is meant for a different audience. But basically, the right time. I, I'm very 
very bullish on the on the price of gold. I think there's lots of upside potential and value creation to come on the gold side of the equation in the coming years. And acquiring a project and doing the expiration in advance of that anticipated increase in, in gold prices and, and valuations is critical to, to, to everybody making money on this particular opportunity. Uh, management and board, as I indicated, extensive experience of large tonnage low grade deposits, both Warren Bates and Dr. Scott Jobin Bevins, who are directors of the company. Both are professional ge geologists, both have 30 to 40 years of experience, both have a specific focus on large tonnage low grade deposits. Uh, David Speck is our CFO, he's got over 35 years of capital markets experience. Uh, Elliot Strachan is the chair of the company and he's been with the uh, Iterations of Thunder Gold since uh, since the company was originally formed more than forty years ago. So he's been he's been through the uh, through the battles with the company as they've moved from project to project to project uh, under different names and different periods, looking for different metals. But you know he's a, he's a huge supporter of the of the vision, not just of Tower Mountain, but also of the Shibandwan Belt as a whole. Bonnie Linda Bartok uh, is a recognized expert in social governance, and she'll have a, a vital role to play as we, you know, begin the process of establishing our social license to operate in the Thunder Bay of Northwestern Ontario uh, District. And Nigel Lee is a professional director with uh, most recently uh, spent 17 years with Yamana. So uh, a very solid board of directors uh, with a lot of uh, practical experience in, in both uh, uh, the junior mining space as well as the uh, geological space. Uh, we have 167 million shares issued and outstanding, 193 million fully diluted, a million dollars in treasury as of, uh, it, you know, it was at the end of May is what's shown, but it's it's more or less the same balance now. Our burn rate when we're not drilling is $50,000 uh, $50, a month, so it's quite low. The insiders hold 15% of the issued shares. Uh, the remainder is largely retail. The institutions, I think, have, uh, those were largely flow through funds that had invested in the, in the company in the past. Uh, and I think a lot of those have probably changed hands. We have to, uh, we have to update that uh, shareholder list. This is an overview, an aerial view of the property. You can see the uh, original claim block, which is approximately 2,000 hectares. We completed our option on that 2,000 hectares two weeks ago and announced it to the market. So that is 100% owned by the company. And at the same time, we also announced that we acquired an additional 50, 50 uh, 500 hectares, sorry, um, from uh, Metallo Resources. And those uh, that was two blocks, one to the northwest, one to the southwest. So we've got a total land holding now in the, in the district in the range of uh, 2,500 hectares in total. The stars that you see are the known gold showings, the 24 known gold showings. The yellow stars or the gold stars are drilled. The silver stars are yet to be drilled, but they offer compelling expiration targets. Um, so the geological, uh, the, the regional and local geological picture is, is complex to say the least, but basically the uh, oval tower mountain intrusive complex sits here on the right hand side of the sh of the screen and is shown in different shades of uh, of pinks and, and mauves and purples and, and that reflects the multi-phase nature of that intrusive complex it's dominantly an alkalic intrusion dominantly it's cyanite uh, to monzonite uh, but there are areas of uh, gabbro and diorite that are present and all of the known mineralization exists along the western boundary of that intrusive complex and that edge is basically like a deck of cards that's been shuffled you have alternating bands or alternating intervals of uh, intrusive rocks mixed with alternating intervals of dominantly uh, volcanic, uh, uh, intermediate volcanic uh, lapilli tufts and tufts. So these things are, are intermixed. The, the, the host volcanic sequence, the intermediate volcanics have been shattered. They've been, they've been fractured down to the crystal level. That's how intense the, the pressures have been on this particular system. And that shattering has caused a fine network of fractures that are then infilled with pyrite and quartz carbonate tourmaline. The quartz carbonate tourmaline veins generally are a centimeter scale. And, and as yet, there is no clear picture on their orientation. They appear, they're almost ubiquitous. They appear everywhere within that uh, 1800 meters of strike length. There are areas that are more um, concentrated or, or more intensely stock worked, um, but that uh, our understanding of that stock work system is still being developed. Same with the pyrite fracturing. Pyrite fracturing is pyrite 
both as disseminated and as fine fracture filling is everywhere. Um, and, and we have a, a, a better handle on where our, our highest pyrite content is, uh, largely as a result of our geophysical surveys that we've completed to date. So this is, uh, this is the 1,800 meters of strike length from UV here in the northwest, which is drilled off on almost 25 meter centers and featured a lot of uh, early bonanza grades from 2002 to 2007. Uh, that was drilled off by a company, Valgold Resources. And in 2007, Valgold discovered the bench discovery, which is further to the south, and basically focused on drilling that off until 2011. Uh, Thunder Gold's uh, predecessor company, White Metal Resources, acquired the claims in 2020 and initiated drill programs in 2021. And that drilling, as, long, as well as our 2023 drilling, basically constitute the the uh, 190 drill hole data set that we currently have. This is what the rocks look like. Uh, you have a feldspar porphyry unit that's dominant uh, towards the northwest of the of the property in the in the UV drill zone, and it carries grades anywhere from zero up to 15 grams per ton. And you cannot visually distinguish which is which, so you can't differentiate between feldspar porphyry that averages nothing and feldspar porphyry that averages 15 grams per ton looks visually looks almost identical. Uh, same with the volcanic fragmental host rocks. This is a classic example where the host has been shattered by uh, by the intrusion uh, or the intrusive events, and uh, that fine fracturing is then infilled with pyrite, which is the dominant uh, those very fine hair-like wispy fractures that you see, and also quartz in some areas quartz carbonate in some areas, but that's, in this particular example, those quartz carbonate veins are discontinuous. And then the, the final unit of note is the cyanites, the alkalic cyanites, which are dominant towards the uh, the bench uh, target area. And uh, same deal, like all three of these units are feature finely disseminated pyrite, pyrite as fracture fill, and then quartz carbonate tourmaline veins up to two centimeters maximum in size, but down to two millimeters as well. And oftentimes our spectacular, our rare instances where we have bonanza gold grades uh, are associated with visible gold that's linked to some of these thicker quartz carbonate veins. But those quartz carbonate veins are at uh, multiple orientations uh, and our, uh, our, structural, uh, our structural mapping to date has not isolated uh, a preferred direction on those, uh, uh, on those quartz carbonate veins, that stockwork system. This is a table that shows and demonstrates our, our drill results from Tower Mountain. It's it's a selection of different holes, and, and uh, uh, but it's typical of the type of mineralization we expect to encounter as we uh, continue to advance the project. So the 2021 to 2023 drill programs are summarized on the table to the left, and the 2002 to 2011 historical holes are summarized on the pro, on the table to the to the right. There's a lot more holes to add especially on the right hand side of uh, of the tables but you know it's it's just a function of time and efficiency this is just meant to give you an overview of selecting in intervals of assay results that we typically see when we're drilling off this deposit so 80 meters at 1.7 grams um you know here's uh here's a zone that starts at surface 21-108 starts 3.7 meters down hole averages 3.9 grams per ton over 24 meters with a, a deeper interval of 12 meters at 0.583. So all of these intervals are relatively consistent. Here you can see one of the one of the more spectacular bonanza grade results, this interval from 105 to 140 meters in hole 137, um, basically 41 and a half meters at uh, 35 grams per ton. That includes a 941 gram per ton assay. That was the highest assay ever returned on the property. And that was a hole that we drilled a, a couple of months ago. But that demonstrates that classic Monanza grade skewer in the in the uh, in the data set. If we treat that properly by capping it, what we end up with is a, a, an average over that 41 and a half meters of uh, a little better than 1.9 grams per ton. So you know there's still gold there outside of that high assay result. And if you treat it properly for resource estimation, which of course everyone will do, then you still got an economically viable interval uh, remaining. Uh, the 2002-2011 drilling shows exactly similar results. So uh, 70 meters at a gram, 40 meters at 1.2 grams, 78 meters at 1.9 grams, 
Uh, here's another one with a, with a Bonanza grade intercept, 52 and a half meters at 17.9 grams. That included the second highest assay in the history of the property. It was drilled in 2004. It originates from the UV zone, which is farther to the north, and that had a 588 gram assay over a meter. So the Bonanza grades are there, but they're very, very rare. And, uh, and that makes me very, very happy because it means that uh, you don't have a significant nugget effect that's going to impact your your future uh, uh, potential future mining of the deposit. So here's a, a sort of um, oblique view of looking along the strike length of the of the northwest trending zone. You have the UV zone up to the north. Of course, the the mauve colored large circles are the higher grade assay results, basically better than five grams per ton. Reds range from one to five. Uh, the yellow ranges from 0.5 to one. And the green, which represents the final uh, interval um, cutoff that's shown on this particular view, the green ranges between 0.3 and 0.5 grams per ton. 0.3 grams per ton is currently the economic cutoff grade of most major operating large tonnage low grade gold mines in the world. So we have UV to the north. It's been drilled off almost on 25 meter centers. What uh, uh, we have, a, you know, there was a, a small historic resource estimated there in the past, but uh, you know, the, we don't uh, we don't reference that simply because it's so out of date, and and uh, that has to be updated going forward. Uh, I think it ended up around 150,000 ounces in that range, at an average gram of around a gram, average grade of around a gram. Uh, but there's been significantly more drilling completed since that resource estimate, but it has been, uh, hasn't been estimated in an updated mineral resource estimate to 43101 standards. Um, so here we have the bench zone to the south. We have the Ellen zone uh, up here in the, uh, the northwest corner, and we have the A zone a little farther to the south. Uh, the A and the Ellen are two of the higher grade uh, drill results or areas that we've drilled to date and both of those start at surface and extend to depths of uh, 50, 60, 70 meters from surface. Uh, there's room to expand on both of those targets going forward. Um, and there's room to fill in in the middle uh, as well as to con continue the drilling further to the south. Uh, and I'll get back to that story in a moment. But lots of upside opportunity, lots of mineralization in this system to, to take a look at. So statistically, I've, I've actually had the, the good fortune to work at uh, the lowest grade gold mine in the world, which is the Paracatu, uh, the Paracatu mine in Brazil. It was owned by Ken Ross and, and, and I was part of the team that looked at the expansion of the Paracatu project after Ken Ross acquired its 100% interest. Uh, I never in a million years thought 0.4 grams per ton was going to work. I was wrong. I was proven wrong. Uh, uh, the longer I spent there, the more I realized... Uh, you know, the benefits of scale and efficiency and, and uh, low mining costs, keeping your costs under control. But mostly what I realized is there is a tremendous strategic advantage to being able to predict your grade from day to day and week to week and month to month and year to year. So the grade at Paracatu, that mineralized system, lacked variability. And, and this is the second best data population I've ever seen in 40 years in the business. It's it's extremely well behaved. It lacks significant variability. Uh, it, there's only seven samples that have returned grades of greater than 30 grams per ton. Uh, statistically speaking, when you composite, when you use composite data analysis and evaluate everything on the same interval length, which is in this case is five meters, we form five meter composites. Uh, we capped our grades, our high grades within the data population at eight grams per ton. It, it only reflected, uh, it only affected a handful of uh, sample intervals. And then we do a statistical analysis of different, different populations, extracting that composite data using things like lithology or alteration or drill direction or or depth from surface or, you know, I've looked at probably. I would say conservatively over 100 to 120 different options to extract data from the total data set and do comparisons trying to identify any uh, any opportunities for for enhanced grades or increased grades and I don't see any. Uh, in this particular instance what I'm showing is a, a random selection of that composite data uh, above a 0.3 cutoff grade because as I mentioned previously 0.3 grams per ton is currently the, the economic cutoff grade for mineral resource estimates and, and plant feed 
at most large tonnage low-grade gold deposits operating today. So I think it's rather relevant. And when we look at the population and we assign a random number to create equal bins of similar size, uh, in this particular case, I've done 10 bins, so 150, 150 composite samples in each bin. And we look at the average grades of each bin, what you see is very little variability. What you're seeing in terms of the average grade is the high of 0.91, a low of 0.685, and everything else in between. So you've got a, these red dots basically represent your average grade of each bin and, and the average grade of the total population, which is over here on the extreme left and you've got very little variability in that average grade, which means predictability, which is a huge benefit in, in future development of this particular project. I think, it's, uh, I think it's far more important in grade than grade in many instances, because predictability just can't be beat. And I'll show you why later in the presentation. Bottom line, at a 0.3 gram cutoff, about 25% of the population uh, uh, the composite pop population passes that 0.3 gram per ton cutoff hurdle. It averages 1.1 grams per ton on an uncapped basis. And when you cap the uh, high grades at 8 grams per ton, you have an average grade of 0.77 grams per ton. And that's, that's probably reflective of reality uh, in terms of evaluating this particular opportunity. So of all the things I've looked at, I, I learned that gold is agnostic about rock type. It's agnostic about logged alteration. It's agnostic about quartz vein content or, or quartz stock work, although I am still reviewing that particular data, trying to, uh, trying to find more clues or opportunities. So what we see is overall, uh, this is for the bench zone only. Uh, for the bench zone and the five meter composite data, there was over 3,100 uh, composite samples. And the average grade of the total population was 0.3 grams per ton. Now that's everything, that's, that's material below the 0.3 gram per ton cutoff as well as material above that 0.3 gram per ton cutoff. But what you see again is that amazing consistency when you start isolating by different rock types. So where no rock type was defined, the average grade is 0.22 where, and I'm gonna have to put my glasses on for this so I can read it. But the fragmental unit, which is basically a volcanic unit that uh, represents the majority of our host rock, the average grade is 0.36. In the volcanics, that's not fragmental, it's 0.27. Uh, in a microcyanite, it's 0.33. In a porphyry, it's 0.21. In the cyanite, it's 0.22. So again, tremendously consistent grades um, across all lithologies. And what we do see when we isolate the, uh, uh, the data population of composite data is using contours of, of IP chargeability response, so as you increase the IP chargeability response, as, as the response gets stronger, what you see is an increase in grade. So in this particular instance, you can see across the board increase in, in average grade of three to four times higher than the mean grade of the total population. So that suggests that the ideal target is IP chargeability. And that's awesome for us because we've re recently doubled the IP chargeable coverage at the property uh, uh, using Abitibi Geophysics. Uh, that survey was completed in January of this year, January, end of January. Uh, and it identified lots of targets that are available for, for immediate drill testing. So you can see our original data set sits here associated with this very strong IP chargeability anomaly. Our 2023 drilling basically chased this system. And what we found with our drill results is uh, the southern portion, kind of in the stronger IP chargeable response that had been drilled in the past. That's where we got our best results. And as we uh, um, move farther to the north in 100 meter step outs, we st still saw anomalous gold mineralization with intervals, uh, with all the holes returning intervals of uh, over 100 meters, averaging between. 0.1 and 0.5 grams per ton. What was absent in these northern holes along this very strong north-south north spine were the, the, the higher grade hits that you need to generate some of the, the more higher um, grades that we're, we're, we're seeking at this particular project. And you got to remember that the width of this system is a couple of hundred meters wide. And I've got a drill hole that tests the horizontal length within that couple hundred meter wide target of less than 100 meters. So we really needed to drill three or four holes per section instead of, instead of one hole per section. But we were just 
scout, we're scouting, we're laying out the groundwork of this uh, opportunity. So our objective with our, uh, our winter program in 2023 was a series of wide spaced holes. And as long as they were mineralized, I was happy. So the IP chargeability identified uh, coincident IP chargeable responses that are coincident with the mapped uh, edge of the intrusion relative to the host volcanics, if that if that makes sense. So the white line represents the, the perimeter of the intrusive complex, the alkalic intrusive complex. And outside of that white perimeter is all volcanic host rocks, largely lapilli tufts and fragmentals. And then these IP chargeability anomalies that are shown in the dash black line, those are our primary exploration targets that require significant drilling. Of these three, which collectively the, the south, the P Papa and the northeast target, uh, collectively represents close to 6,000 meters of perspective strike length um, with the uh, coincident with the uh, contact of the intrusive. Of those three targets, we have one drill hole. And that's right here at the P zone. It was drilled by Naranda in the early 1980s. It's drilled in a north-south direction, so it's parallel to the contact. And basically since then, there's been uh, over 17 rock samples were taken in the P Papa, P -Papa target area. Uh, those 100 samples define approximately 100 meters of strike length, more or less in an east-west direction across this contact. All of them were returned in intrusives. They were, they were logged and mapped as intrusive rocks, which is interesting because the grades are greater than six, gram per, six grams per ton on average. Uh, they range from a, a low of one gram all the way up to uh, 27 grams per ton. And, and uh, that is a very compelling exploration target for us in the not too distant future. All of these targets are permanent. They're fully permanent. I could, uh, I could move a drill on them within a, a week or two after we advise our Fort William First Nation of our exploration plans. Those permits, those permits are approved. Those drill permits are approved. But we, uh, we do want to maintain our relationship with the Fort William First Nation on whose traditional territory Tower Mountain lies. So we make sure that we uh, keep them up to speed on our exploration uh, investments. So uh, I spend a lot of time educating people uh, particularly uh, people that are unfamiliar with uh, with large tonnage low grade deposits, educating them on on large tonnage low grade deposits. And here's one of the slides that I use to do so. Uh, I have direct experience at Parak two, as I mentioned, the lowest grade uh, gold mine in the world with an average grade of 0.4. Fort Knox was another project I worked on with Ken Ross when I was with their technical team. It's uh, currently been operating for the last 20 years at a grade of less than a gram. But more compelling are Malarctic and Detour Lake, two Canadian large tonnage, low grade open pit mines that are currently operating quite successfully. Both produce over 700,000 ounces a year annually. Detour Lake has um, delivered a grade of greater than a gram per ton to the mill one time since 2013. And Malarctic, uh, it started out with grades that were less than a gram per ton, but uh, it climbs over the gram per ton mark, uh, you know, several times in the last 10 years, but it only gets up to a high of 1.2 grams per ton. And those mines demonstrate the opportunity that we're trying to establish at Tower Mountain. Large tonnages, low grades. And there's several other development projects and, and operating mines in Canada with similar metrics. And, and some of those are shown on this particular graph. We have Cote, 7.2 million ounces uh, at an average grade of less than a gram. Uh, Spring Pole, which is currently being developed approximately 200 kilometers to the north of us, uh, almost 4 million ounces at less than a gram. Moss Lake, uh, they're, they're, I have to update the slide for Moss because of their recent mineral resource uh, update. They've got 6 million uh, uh, six million ounces at a grade hovering around a gram per ton on average. Uh, the Blackwater project in BC, which is probably the best comparable to us, uh, an average grade of uh, 0.8, you know, less than 0.8 with an 8 million ounce resource. That, again, the opportunity that we're trying to develop here. The Tower Mountain data, if you look at it, uh, uh, I already talked about the composite data, but even uh, when you look at the raw assay files themselves, the individual assay files, uh, we see at a 0.3 gram per ton cutoff, an average grade of 1.085, which compares very favorable to the composite average grade of 1.11. Uh, and 20, 21-22% 20, uh, 20, of the population above that cutoff grade, which 
hints or suggests a potential strip ratio of, you know, three to one, three to one, four to one in that range. And that, I think in rising gold price environment, that's a more than interesting project for the future. Uh, in terms back to, uh, these are the top 10 gold producers in Canada today. Uh, the lowest grade deposits, Detour in Canadian Malarctic on the left, average grades of less than a gram. And then Bruce Jack in British Columbia and uh, Macasa in uh, Ontario with grades of, uh, in the case of Bruce Jack, almost nine grams per ton and at Macasa, 16 grams per ton. The columns in this graph relate to the left hand, um, uh, the left hand axis. And that's mapping your all-in sustaining cost per ounce. And you can see very clearly that uh, Macasa, Bruce Jack, Detour Lake, and Canadian Malarctic all offer the same all-in sustaining cost, somewhere between $900 to $950 an ounce. So even, you know, the higher grades, the benefit of higher grades at the, at the Macasa and Bruce Jack mine, that benefit is negated by the benefit of just overwhelming tonnages at Detour Lake in Canadian Mile Arctic. And, and I guarantee that the production profile at Detour, uh, Detour in Mile Arctic is a more stable and predictable path than it is at Bruce Jack and Macasa, simply because they don't have the high grade hits and, and uh, misses that, uh, that you typically see in these high grade underground systems. So all of this information is read readily available on CDAR if you want to check it. Uh, it comes directly out of the MD&As and annual reports and financial statements of the companies that are noted. And I, uh, I think it's a very compelling indicator that grade is not necessarily king. We've done our uh, preliminary metallurgical test work here. Great news across the board. Recoveries of better than 90% are indicated uh, acid consuming. So the mineralization will not generate any acid mine drainage, which is a huge plus on the environmental front. The only negatives that came out about the test work is the, the ore is relatively hard with a bond work index of greater than 20. Uh, in the past year since I joined the company, we've doubled our induced polarization coverage, uh, uh, got about 40% of the total property. Well, that was the original 2000 hectares, so we're probably down to about 30% of the current 2500 hectares that's been covered with uh, true 3D IP chargeability uh, surveys. We've completed our metallurgical testing and demonstrated that the ore is not refractory. We've uh, completed additional ICP data looking for relationships between gold and other metals. And to date, that's not led to any clues. We relogged over 25,000 meters of the historical core. Again, looking for clues with respect to lithology and alteration. That hasn't, uh, that hasn't pulled any information out of the system. So, you know, again, as I, I can't iterate is there's no visual clues when you're looking at the core to distinguish between core that grades 15 grams per ton and core that grades nothing. Uh, we completed our initial drill program 4,000 meters in, in less than seven weeks, I think, in total. Very efficient drill program, very low cost, less than 250 bucks a meter. And it identified 90 to 100,000 cubic meters of potentially prospective ground between the bench A and Ellen targets. And it demonstrated viable lower grade mineralization along a 700 meter step out to the north. So I'm very pleased with the drill results. I think they returned exactly what we were looking for. And uh, I'm anxious to get in there and start drilling some of these other targets. Uh, we have a very low burn rate, as I mentioned earlier, less than 50,000 a month. And we have cash flow coming into the company from properties that we've optioned elsewhere uh, in Canada and around the world. Uh, junior explorers have one job. And, and the key performance indicator of junior exploration companies has to be meters. The, num the number of meters drilled is where the, that's where the value lies in the junior space. So here's 16 different large, large, large tonnage, low grade deposits around Canada and the United States. On average, what we see is about 35 ounces of mineral of gold resources added per meter drilled. And that's reflected with the silver color here on the, on the slide. So that's the average of the, of the 16, um, 16 uh, examples that I chose to look at in this particular instance. And, and where I'm going with this is just to demonstrate the importance of drilling. Uh, the more meters you drill, the better your mineral resource is going to be, the more accurate you're going to be able to predict the future, and the less surprises you're going to suffer. And it's not to say that the, the people that are returning more ounces than the average are doing a better job or a worse job. I think what it reflects is 
probably these people on the right hand side of the average uh, they're at a different stage as as opposed to a, a detour lake where we had a million meters of drilling when they did their feasibility study or uh, spring pole which had uh, I think it was 400,000 meters if my memory serves me correctly but in every instance every long-term low-grade comparable on this graph has well over 100,000 meters of drilling and, and in 95% of the cases well over 250,000 meters of drilling. They have to in order to develop the resource necessary to get to the stage of, uh, of potential development and, and that's our story. This is our five-year plan. We have a very aggressive plan to double our mineral resources every year for the next five years and I think if we're successful in doing that we'll generate significant shareholder value going forward. Uh, currently we have 45,000 meters drilled and if we use the metric uh, that I just showed you in the slide of 35 ounces uh, per meter drilled, then we're probably sitting in the range of a resource of somewhere between uh, one to two million ounces and and that uh, there's several other factors that kind of uh, you know point us in that direction. I don't think one and a half million ounces of, uh, at a grade of 0.8 is particularly a compelling investment opportunity for most of the market, especially today. Um, but I think we are obligated to grow that resource in the future. So that's our that's our focus going forward. Uh, to double it would require another 45,000 meters of core, probably an investment in exploration drilling in the range of three to four million dollars in total. And that would get us our first double. And then we just keep building off of that momentum going forward. So the plan is to do it in stages. And we're always interested in people that understand the opportunity that we're presenting here. I think, again, that's very compelling. I think there's district scale potential here that there's going to be multiple discoveries. Uh, there's two already, in my opinion. And I think we're going to grow that in the future as more and more investment dollars come into the into the uh, into the uh, Eastern Shabandwin Greenstone Belt. And with that, that uh, that concludes the presentation. So I'm happy to take uh, take any questions. I think we've got about 20 minutes left, if, if I'm not uh, not mistaken. This is actually a, a photograph of the 941 gram per ton assay over a meter and a half. You can see it's associated with a quartz carbonate tourmaline vein. Uh, you can see the sulfide mineralization in there as well. And again, IP is a, a tremendous benefit to us. We've got more IP coverage than anybody else in the district and uh, lots of targets to pick and choose from uh, and we can mobilize the drill to those targets immediately. Perfect. Thank you, Wes, for the in-depth presentation. I'm sure everyone appreciates it. You can go ahead and stop sharing your screen and we can get into the Q&A session here. Uh, we'll post the survey. If you're a little shy and you don't want to post your questions in the chat, feel free to fill out the survey and Wes will be more than happy to touch base with you and you can have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. So I'll post that in the chat right now. But if you do have questions, please do feel free to submit them in the chat. We do have a couple of pre-submitted questions here. So you you did mention that all in drilling costs reduced by 30% to $250 per meter. How did you reduce those drilling costs exactly? Well, I'll be, I, 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 I don't want to be uh, critical, but I mean, I think that the drilling contractor we hired for our latest program, um, Shibugabu Diamond Drilling out of Quebec, uh, they, they they were just able to, uh, first of all, I think their equipment operated reliably and, and suffered, uh, we suffered less down, downtime. They, they were just a very efficient diamond drilling company. And and the actual contract cost per meter was a little higher than, than companies that have been used in the past. But basically, they were more productive. They, they produced more core uh, faster and more reliably than, than some of the companies that had drilled on the property in the past. And this Shibugumu is a, a newer contractor. You had one previously. Uh, well, I had never worked with them previously, but it's uh, you know, basically they they operate. I think it's a hundred drill rigs around Canada, and they had drill rigs that were already close to us in uh, in the Thunder Bay region because they were working on the uh, the Dixie project. They have a number of drills deployed at the Dixie project, which is uh, just outside Red Lake, and they actually are the uh, diamond drill contractor for Delta. So they. They had a drill five kilometers from the property. So we also saved on MOVE and demo costs. It was brilliant. Perfect. Well, speaking of Delta, um, would you or is there any consideration of mergers and acquisitions or consolidations in the Shibandawan Greenstone region? 
Well, I mean, <laughs> uh, that's that's kind of a difficult question to answer. I mean, that makes sense from a from a value creation perspective. I mean, bigger is always better, and, and uh, you know, mergers of, of ourselves with other companies in the Shibando and Greenstone Belt should absolutely be uh, be foremost on the minds of the CEOs that are currently operating in the district. Uh, you know, it's it's all about scalability. Like, uh, uh, if you think about it, Hemlo is considered a, a, an amazing success story in Canadian mining. But I look at it and all I see is value destruction because you had three mills, you had three mines, you had three head frames, you had three of everything. And uh, if all of those had been able, if you had been able to, to set aside personalities and, and so forth and merge all of those opportunities into one mining complex, uh, I think the shareholders of all three companies would have been much better served in the long run. Perfect. Well, thank you, Wes. Those are the questions I have here. Uh, and it looks like the chat is a little shy today. So I will encourage them to again fill out their survey and hopefully they would like to meet you one on one. Um, any closing remarks for, for today's presentation? Absolutely. I mean, it's tough. Uh, it's tough sort of putting yourself front and center out there on the, uh, on the World Wide Web. So happy to answer anybody's questions uh, either personally. You can, our contact details are on the presentation. You can get all the information you require from www.thundergoldcorp.com. Uh, the a copy of this corporate presentation is available there for uh, for download, and you can peruse it as uh, at your leisure and, and formulate your questions. And uh, I'm more than happy to go into greater detail. It's always uh, it's always tough when you're uh, when you're dealing with the time limit when you're trying to discuss these things. There's just so many more things that I could say to, to shed clarity on the situation. And, and I realize that not everybody has an equal uh, level of comfort with different aspects of the industry. And, and, you know, some people really understand expiration. Some people understand mining. Some people understand the, the financial uh, aspects of the job. But, you know, the bottom line is the, the number one rule of investing is buy low and sell high. We're currently low, man. Just like every one of, uh, just like all of the all of the companies that I've ever been involved with, the, there's a tremendous, uh, there's been a tremendous slide in the valuation of uh, both producing and and exploration companies, and I think that the price of gold is fundamentally solid going forward in terms of supply supply and demand. I think uh, I think some at some point in time, interest rates are not going to go up, and I think they'll be. Uh, There'll be a, a significant increase in the gold price, which will drive a significant increase in the valuation of the, oh. the companies looking for and mining gold. And I see this period as perhaps the greatest value creation opportunity in the gold sector since I started in 40 years. If I, uh, if I had more free cash available, I know exactly where I'd be putting it. <laughs>